Let's take God's word and turn to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 together, verse 28. Mark 12, verse 28. And let's have a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for what we've got to sing this morning. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's grace. Oh, the amazing grace of God. The grace that taught us to fear. And that same grace that our fears relieved by just a look at the Savior. Oh, we thank you that we don't stand in our own righteousness. Oh, but through faith we stand in Christ alone, justified in the sight of a holy God, clothed with the righteousness of His perfect Son. And it's that Son we get to read about this morning. Oh, Lord, direct us in Your Word. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Give us a taste for heaven's joys. Oh, Lord, we pray. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Mark 12, verse 28 reads this way. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. This is God's Word. We find ourselves in a string of passages in which religious leaders are coming to Jesus and are confronting Him with questions. The Sanhedrin was the religious council of that day. It made up the religious authorities among the Jews. It was made up of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the uh, the scribes. They have sent a delegation of representatives to Jesus to ask him some very pointed questions. They're not asking questions, though, though, out of curiosity because they really want to learn from Jesus or they want to submit to his teaching, but they are wanting to trip him up in his words. They want to uh, cause him to stumble. They want to find something that they can get him on and that they can bring him down. In verses 13 through 17, the Pharisees and the Herodians confront Jesus with a kind of a political question. They ask whether it's whether one should pay taxes to Rome. They confront him in public in, before the watching public. And, and, and Jesus very wisely answers by taking a Roman coin which had Caesar's image on it and said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And we, a couple weeks ago, saw just the wisdom of Christ in his answer. In verses 17 through 27, the next group comes to Jesus. So the Pharisees and Herodians, they go away. Now the Sadducees come. You remember the Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection, the final resurrection. They come asking this impossible question about a a, uh, woman whose first husband dies and then she gets married to his brother and then he dies and then another brother and he dies and another brother and she's married seven times and then they ask the question, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? But Jesus, again, answers them in a way that reveals his supreme wisdom and and they are forced to run home with their tail between their legs in embarrassment. They are all confronting Jesus in public 
testing Jesus with their questions and seeking to bring him down. And, and, and now in verses 28 through 34, we see another question brought to Jesus. The, the Pharisees have tried to get him. The Sadducees have tried to get him. And now here come the scribes. Here comes a scribe, a singular scribe. The scribes were like lawyers that studied the law of God. They studied it inside and out. That's what they spent their time doing. They were experts in interpreting the law among the Jews. And on this day, this scribe has heard Jesus answer the first two groups well, it says in verse 28. And he decides to ask him another question. I'd like for us to look at this text really in three parts. First, we're going to look at the question of the scribe. Second, the answer of Jesus. And then third, the response of Jesus concerning the scribe. So first, look at, with me at the question of the scribe. This question seems different. It seems that this scribe may be genuinely curious about Jesus. He, he doesn't seem to be coming in quite the combative way that the Pharisees and the Sadducees had approached Jesus. Uh, he, they, they, he comes with a question, and it's not as much of a gotcha question, uh, but he asked Jesus which commandment is the most important of all. This was not an uncommon question in that day. There, these were the kinds of questions the scribes like to sit around and think about. Okay, you've got all these commandments. Which is the most important? And this was not a question uh, of which, though, that comes first in terms of if you think of the Ten Commandments. So what's the first commandment? What's the second command? What's the third? It's not, a, it's not a matter of order. It's a matter of priority. What's the weightiest of the commands? In a sense, he's asking, what is the chief duty of man? What, what does God expect of us? What, how does God call every person to live in, when, in his law? What is man's duty toward God? So he asked this question. Now, secondly... See with me the answer of Jesus. Again, we see the stunning wisdom of Christ in answering the questions of the best and the brightest of this day. He doesn't stumble at all. He's not tripped up in the least bit. He has an answer. And he says in verse 29, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and with all your strength. When Jesus says this, he doesn't just bring it out of thin air. He's quoting the, what is known as the Jewish Shema. Uh, it, it comes from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. The Shema was quoted often by the Jews uh, to remind them of who their God is and who they are in relation to him. It was intended to focus their affections on God. And it reminded them that God was not just an impersonal cosmic force out there somewhere, but that he's our God. He's our covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. He's our God, and we, we belong to him. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of Moses. He's the God who led his people out of Egyptian bondage. It reminded them that he was their God. He's a personal God. And the Shema taught the people that they were not to love God for the stuff He gives them or for the blessings He brings in their lives. They were to love God for God. And so it is today, friends. You and I are called to love God for God. And one of the ways you know that you're making some progress, that you're growing in the Christian life, is that less and less you find your love for God hinging on what He can do for you and more and more for who He is. That God is lovely and wonderful and worthy of His creature's ultimate affections. He is the Lord our God. And so we should love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, with, with all that we are. He is worthy of every single person's, uh, with every breath uh, that is in their lungs. He is worthy of our love. Our love for God should be white hot, not cold or indifferent. 
We're to love God with all that we are, with our whole self. You see, really, sin, when we sin, fundamentally it's a problem of love. It is saying that in that moment, God, you have not given me all that. You've not been completely good. You've not given me this thing, and I'm going to do what you've said not to. I'm not going to follow you in obedience. It's at the root is an issue of love, whether we love God and lo- love Him or not. And what we learn from what Jesus says here is that we're to live all of our life, all of life is to be lived for the glory of God. We are to have an all-consuming love for God. Friends, this is what the law of God requires. That we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then, and then Jesus gives the scribe more than he asked for. He gives him the second most important command. The second is this. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other greater commandments than these. So get this. Flowing from this all-consuming love for God is to be a tangible love for neighbor. Tangible love for others. And the way we are to love our neighbor is in the way we would want our neighbor to treat us. And our neighbor does not mean just the people who live near us. It doesn't mean our neighbors are, our, our, our neighbors are, are not just our family and friends. Jesus makes clear, and though those are our neighbors, Jesus makes clear in the parable of the Good Samaritan that our neighbor, everyone, everyone is our neighbor. We are to treat everyone how we would want them to treat us, even those who, especially those, who cannot do anything for us in return. Those who maybe we have a difficult time loving, we're, those we're called to love. And this is a verse that is commonly misrepresented, misunderstood, and misquoted by unbelievers and sadly often by professing believers. I'm looking forward to, in the, in the future sometime, doing a, I think, a Sunday night series on uh, misinterpreted Bible verses. There's some that you see out there that are commonly quoted, but I don't think, like, uh, if, you, if you know the, the movie Princess Bride, um, and uh, and the, uh, the Spaniard says, I don't think that phrase means what you think it means. And um, anyway, I, I, often we can hear verses quoted. This is one of those. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. To the total neglect, and this is often the problem, the total neglect of the context around the verse. You see, friends, there is a first in priority command and a second here, isn't there? Jesus makes that clear. The first is this. The second is this. Notice that the most important is love God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then a love for neighbor is to flow from that. Someone might ask, well, if if, Devin, if I love God with all that I have, then what love remains for my neighbor? So do I just need to kind of go find a cabin in the woods and get away from everyone where all I do is think about God? No, I don't think that's the case. See, friends, love for neighbor is to flow from our love for God. In fact, your love for God should bubble over toward your neighbor. In in loving God, you love those whom he has made in his image, right? Right? And to love neighbor without love for God, without regard for God, will mean that you and your neighbor define what love is. See, that's part of the problem. We like to quote, love your neighbor as yourself, but then we like to also define what love is. And that's where so many are going so far wrong. See, we we live in a day in which Love is defined accepting and condoning and endorsing everything that everyone does. But no, that's not the way God defines love. Remember, this God of amazing, eternal love, it is also a holy love. And he calls his people to love with a holy love ourselves. God defines what love is. This word translated love is agape. It's not just warm, bubbly feelings. 
that's a lot of times the way love gets defined, isn't it? It's the, the, just the feelings that I have. The, the, these these uh, warm, compassionate feelings. It, it, is a, it is a love, agape love, though, is a love that sacrifices for another. It's a love that is committed. It is a love that acts and does for the good of another. It's not just warm sentimentality. It has hands and feet. It puts words to action. The love God calls us to have for our neighbor, he defines and he models for us. We're to love as he loves. His love is steadfast. It is long-suffering. He is full of loving kindness. Psalm 36 verse 7 says, How precious is your steadfast love, O God. And his love is a holy love. And so the faithful Christian should seek to love his neighbor as himself with a love like God has modeled for us and defines in his word. So works done in the name of love of neighbor that are against what God has called righteous in his word, it's not love of neighbor. It's just not. And to, go, to, to, to condone what God has condemned in the name of love for neighbor is a farce. It's a farce. I'm amazed at what I hear professing Christians condone under the banner of, I'm just loving my neighbor. Friends, if the way to really know God and to be reconciled to God and to have a relationship with Him is found by repentance and faith toward God, turning from sin and clinging to Christ by faith, and it is, then the most loving thing we can do is to lovingly point your neighbor to that truth. To not just point a finger that you're a sinner, but to say you're a sinner who needs a Savior. And Here he is. Here's who he is. But may, may our words and actions agree Jesus' words here remind us that to say you love God with no love for your neighbor, it rings hollow. Again, back to the story of the Good Samaritan. Remember, the man who's beaten and cast to the roadside. What happens? Who, who passes by? A priest? A, a Levite? Uh, two re religious people pass by on the other side. They keep their distance. These are people who would say, I love God. And, and the point of the Good Samaritan parable is that, that that saying you love God with no love for neighbor is, is hollow. It's cheap. How can we say we love God and then not love those he has made in his image? We're called to love God with vibrant, warm affection for God that shows itself in obedience to him which includes loving service toward our neighbors. Our love for God is to be an all-consuming love that bubbles over for our neighbor. Well, when the scribe hears Jesus' answer, he is impressed. Look at verse 32. Verse 32. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other beside him and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Why does he bring up burnt offerings and sacrifices? Well, that's also referring back to the Old Testament where, where we, we read that obedience is better than sacrifice. In other words, it, it's, it's better to lovingly obey God and follow God than to just offer up ritualistic sacrifices and offerings to him with no real inner heart change toward him. So now, now see with me Jesus' response concerning the scribe. Jesus' response concerning the scribe. Verse 34. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more question. Jesus discerns that this man had answered him wisely. He had answered him thoughtfully. The scribe seems to be genuinely considering what Jesus is saying. 
And he seems to have a genuine admiration for the wisdom of Christ. What did he say? He says, you are right, teacher. You've spoken truly. But Jesus makes clear where he is in relation to the kingdom of God. Do you see this? He says to the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, now, now remember, if we go back, we're going through Mark, and if you remember back in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee preaching. This is the first thing we see him preaching. So Mark, Mark is helping us to see that this is what characterized Jesus' preaching and teaching. What did he come preaching? Repent. He says the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That was the message. That's what characterizes Jesus' message. And by the way, that's what characterized the apostles' message as we read in Acts. And that's our message today. Repent and believe the gospel. And so we see uh, the kingdom of God, Mark is making clear, is that it has come, the kingdom of God has come in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Jesus steps on the scene, when he says the kingdom of God is here, it's he, it, it was there in person in Jesus Christ. The, he is the one who had brought the kingdom of God. So what is Jesus saying to the man? Back in our account here. He's saying, you're close. You're close, but you're not close enough. And when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to the kingdom of God, close only counts, we're reminded, close only counts what? In horseshoes and hand grenades, right? Jesus says, you're close, but you're not close enough. You're, you're near, but you're still outside the kingdom of God. Understand, friends, this would be a highly offensive thing for Jesus to say to anyone from among the religious elite of his day. Jesus says this with intention. He is speaking to a scribe. These theologians who handle the law all day long, interpret, and, interpret it and teach it and read it, he's saying, well, you're, you're close, you're near, but you're not in. That, that would have been a very provocative thing to say. I can imagine this scribe thinking to himself, I study the scriptures all day. I, I attend synagogue worship. I teach the law. What does he mean? I'm not far from the kingdom of God. If anyone's in, I'm in. And this, is, this is, though, what we see Jesus doing here is like what he says to Nicodemus, right? John 3, Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He comes to Jesus by night, he, and he recognizes something about Jesus. This, this scribe recognizes about Jesus, doesn't he? What, is, what did he say? In John chapter 3, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And what we don't read Jesus say is, you know what, I appreciate you finally recognizing that I'm a good teacher, that I'm sent from God. What does he say? He cuts right to the chase. (laughs) Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, He cannot see the kingdom of God. He cuts right to it. What was Jesus saying to Nicodemus? You're not far from the kingdom of God, but you're not in it. You're close, but you're not close enough. In Mark chapter 10, we read about this rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. And he comes saying, professing that he he keeps the commandments. That he's a morally upright person. And Jesus looks at him and loves him and says to him, you lack one thing. You're near the kingdom of God, but you're not in it. You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. We read, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. He almost had the treasure of heaven, but he clung to his earthly treasures. 
He was not far from the kingdom, but he was not in it. He was close, but he was not close enough. Notice how this scribe responds to Jesus. Did you catch this? You are right, teacher. You have truly said. He, he, he was near the kingdom of God. Yes, Jesus was a good teacher. Yes, he taught truth. But no one enters the kingdom by believing Jesus was simply a good teacher and that he taught true things. Anyone who is being reasonable, that reads history, has to admit that the man named Jesus was a good teacher who taught good morals, who taught good things like you should love your neighbor as yourself. But friend, you can know that and believe that and split hell wide open. It's not it. You'll just be close, but fall eternally short. No one enters the kingdom by believing Jesus was a good teacher, that he taught true things. Everyone who's, everyone should, should understand that, but the scribes will call Jesus a good teacher. This scribe calls him a good teacher, but he needs to keep going. He needs to keep pressing in on who this Jesus is. Don't stop at good teacher. You need to keep going. For what did Jesus teach? He taught that he was more than a good teacher. He taught he is the Son of God, that he was sent by the Father, that the kingdom of God had come near in and through him. What did Jesus teach? He taught that people everywhere should repent and believe the gospel. That they should turn from going their own way and living according to their own agenda and that they should believe Him. They should believe in Him. What did Jesus teach? Remember Mark 2 church. As He reclined at table in the house of tax collectors and sinners and here they come. It's one of the first occasions we see the scribes of the Pharisees when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors said to his disciples why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners and when Jesus heard it he said to them those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick I came not to call the righteous but sinners and in that Jesus was not saying that the Pharisees were okay he's saying They're sick and they won't admit it. They're sick and they don't know it. And so until they know it, until they see it, they're also not going to see their need for a doctor. You only get Jesus when you come to Him as the great physician that your soul needs. And if you won't admit you're sick, that you're sin sick, you'll never come to Him in a way that brings you once and for all into the kingdom of God. Friends, it is no wonder that the the church's gospel teaching that all people, every person, is a sinner in desperate need of a Savior is always under attack. No, 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 no. Don't tell people they're sinners. They already know it. I'm sorry. No, they don't understand that they are not in a good place with God. Oh, what, what a devilish false teaching. To preach the gospel without telling people that they're sinners in need of a Savior. That is causing people by the droves to fall short of salvation that comes through Christ. Because this is where you start at. And sadly, the gospels are full of people who got so very near the kingdom, but they did not enter in. They got close but not close enough they like the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribe on this day are seen to be walking right up to the door of heaven the door into the kingdom of God but then they turn and they walk away how tragic is there anything more tragic than that Jesus, or Judas literally kisses the door of heaven and walks away in the Garden of Gethsemane. Even among Jesus' own disciples, we see one near the kingdom of God, but not enter in. He misses it all together. This text doesn't tell us what happens with this scribe. It leaves us to to ponder about ourselves. I think that's what this account is intended to do. 
It doesn't tell us what happens to him. Boy, I wish it did. Don't you hate movies that are cliffhangers, that leaves you wondering? But I think what's, what, why, why this is given to us in this way is it's to, it's to cause us to read about this scribe and say, what about me? What about me? Am I near or am I in? Where is my soul at in regard to this Savior? So how about us? Where are we in relation to the kingdom of God? Have we entered in by faith in Jesus Christ? How about you, friend? Are you content to live near the kingdom of God but never really enter in? Do do you think that you've lived a pretty good life like this scribe and you're trusting that it will, it's all going to shake out in the end when you meet God? I hope this text just like a stick of dynamite just blows that out of your soul. Are you content to to just be at arm's distance from Jesus like this scribe saying, boy, he answers well. Man, he's a good teacher. You can get some wisdom from reading about Jesus, but, but not ever coming to him in humility and seeking the salvation that comes through him. This, this text this morning where we see a self-righteous scribe who's morally upright come to Jesus and ask about what God expects of every person with breath in their lungs. What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says to him, you should love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when we read that, I wonder about you, friend. When when you read Jesus say that the first commandment is that you are to love God with all your, your soul, your heart, your strength, Do any of us in here pretend we have kept that command? We haven't kept that command for five minutes. We've fallen short, haven't we? And that's what the law of God does. It reveals to me I've I've fallen short. You've fallen short. We have not. We have not done all that God has commanded. We have not loved God in the way that we are to love God The law of God, Paul will say, is our schoolmaster that instructs us and leads us, points us to Christ. It it tells us the problem. It shows us our need. It shows us we've fallen short and so that we might turn our gaze, turn our eyes toward him and look to him for the salvation that comes from him alone. That's what it ought to do. We've all fallen short and we need a great Savior. Luke chapter 2, verse 11, we quote it at Christmas time. It tells us this, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a teacher, which is Christ the Lord. No, that's not what it says. A prophet who is Christ the Lord. No. A good man. No. All those things are true. What does it say? A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Which is Christ the Lord. I wonder about you, friend, if you're here. I'm glad you're here this morning. I wonder if, there's, if you're here this morning and you've not come to believe in Christ as the Savior from your sins. If you've not come to trust in Him as your Savior. Has, have you ever called on Him, seeing yourself as a sinner in need of salvation through Christ and said, Lord, save me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Save me. That's a very simple thing, isn't it? But it's also a very difficult thing. In fact, apart from the grace of God, it is an impossible thing. Because what do we, by our nature, like to do? We don't like to think that way. We, I'm a, oh, I'm not a sinner, and I don't need a Savior. I'm doing all right. I'm pretty righteous. I try to do good things. I love God sometimes, I think. I do some nice things. Yeah, but but may, the, may the Holy Spirit so open our eyes to see our desperate need of Christ. And then, friends, there is life for a look at the Savior. Now, you'll, no, you'll no longer be not far from the kingdom of God. You're going to be in it and secure in it and in it forever. That's a... Wonderful thing. That's the salvation that comes through Christ. 
And so, church, this text has so much for us this morning. Uh, If you're here without Christ, I pray that you'll see these things and that you'll put your trust in this Savior. And if you have come and trust in Christ as your Savior, this is your marching orders. Love God. The, the, one of the church fathers, Augustine, he said, love God and then do what you want. You see, the love for God is a, is a love that drives out all lesser loves, that begins to shape our loves and what we love in this world and how we live. And so grow in the love of God. Get to know him in his word. Get to know him in prayer. Ask him to just fan the flames of love for him in your heart. A kind of love for him that will just stir you to follow him. That will help you to gain victory over sin. There is an all-consuming love for for God that that we're, we're taught to have here in this text this morning. May the Lord help us to do so. Let's pray.